Thank you all very much for, for coming back. Um, I'm Shihoko Goto with the Wilson Centers Asia program. And although we've had a very lively discussion this, uh, this morning, I think this is the, the panel to like, focus on. Um, <laughs> of course. I am, of course, a little bit biased. But I say that um, in, in all seriousness because trade and frustration with China's economic policies have been at the center of the tensions, ongoing tensions between the United States and China. And of course, we've already had this morning discussions about the geopolitical implications of trade and economic policy between the two countries. But let's dig a little bit deeper and also look at some of the most recent developments on the trade front. Um, we've been able to reach a deal of sorts uh, last week, which really has been a ceasefire of um, the rationing up of the tariff war. And nothing has been formally signed as of yet, uh, but the United States is saying that this is phase one of three phases in a comprehensive agreement in reaching a trade agreement with, with China. China, however, is not sharing that language, but instead merely talking that this is progress. So I'm excited to be able to introduce an a amazing panel of speakers who are very much in the trenches on this topic. Um, to, from my left, your right, is Bob Davis of the Wall Street Journal. Um, he's also been with the Wilson Center. Uh, next to him is uh, Meg Lunsager, who is a public policy scholar here at the Center and also the former US Executive Director to the IMF. And then to her uh, right um, is um, John Frisbee of Hills and Company. So let me start um, with you, Bob. Um, we've reached a deal last week, but you've already tweeted that essentially it's not a win-win, but China's <laughs> come out ahead. How is that, and um, what are the ultimate US objectives in competing with China on the economic front. Right, I mean, I think we haven't reached a deal. We've reached a, um, a preliminary um, agreement on having a deal. Okay. And what's, what's the deal involved? The deals involve China buying more agricultural stuff, which before there was a trade deal, they bought a lot of agricultural, you know, a lot of soybeans. Um, and what does the U.S. get out of this? They get, presumably, if it works out, they get, um, uh, openings in the financial services market, uh, a currency deal that they announced um, in February that they already had. Um, so they get basically nothing. They get only things that China was going to do on its own. Um, I mean, I think one of the problems in this whole trade war is that we've gone, we've shifted too much to the idea that China only gets ahead by cheating, um, as opposed to China sees in its interest a certain degree of reform. They were moving along a track toward opening up the financial services and manufacturing sectors, reducing joint ventures, so on and so forth. So you'd have to say, you have to ask yourself the question, if Henry Paulson was the Treasury Secretary today, would they be getting anything, uh, would they be getting anything more than Henry Paulson would have gotten under, an, you know, the strategic and economic dialogue? Um, now if they go beyond that to the sort of goals that were sketched out in the Section 301 report of very, very fundamental changes in the Chinese economy, that would be a big deal. But at the moment, I mean, that's a really long way away. Right. So um, again, there is no agreement as of yet. We're actually not sure of what the preliminary understanding between the two sides is other, either. So um, with that, um, perhaps you could talk a little bit, John, about which sectors could potentially gain from a potential agreement. This is all very hypothetical, but we do know that from the agricultural perspective, it has suffered, American farmers have suffered a great deal over the last uh, uh, year or so um, as a result, not only of the escalating tariffs, but also lost opportunities because the United States has withdrawn from the TPP. Does this actually move, become a way forward for American farmers? And what are some of the other sectors that could potentially win? Sure. Um, 
I guess I'd say one thing about TPP, we were actually never in it, so we didn't quite withdraw <laughs> from it. Um, but I think for, for American companies, uh, nothing changed last week for them at this point. If, if you're in an American company looking at the U.S.-China trade tensions, looking at the China market, um, you still have the same amount of uncertainty today that you probably had last week. Yes, it's nice to have uh, some more positive signaling uh, to perhaps arrest the, the downward slide we were on, um, but I wouldn't say anything has changed from a, from a company's perspective that would lead them to do something different this week versus last, last week. The impact of the trade war so far on companies is, is mixed. For, for some companies, they've definitely seen cost increases due to tariffs. And for some of our manufacturers, that's been on the order of several hundred million dollars, for example. Um, for others that are selling in China, they've seen lost sales. And agriculture is, is an example of that. But it's not just them, because think about this. If you're a company in China, whether you're a foreign multinational operating there, or if you're a Chinese company, and you're also looking at the US-China trade tensions, and you have a US supplier to your operation, you might be thinking, I don't know if they're still going to be able to supply me in a year's time, either specifically because it might be a certain technology that's under question in the debate, or even just more generally, if there's some risk, or if a company sees some risk in a, in a broader rift between the two countries that might call into question uh, the reliability of that U.S. supplier. So maybe they're also starting to look at other suppliers from other countries, not just domestically, but perhaps from European or, or Japanese companies that operate in China, too. So uh, lost sales in China have been another one. I think um, agriculture in particular has been whipsawed because it's on again, off again. Um, this year, agriculture exports to China varies by type of product, but 40 to 50 percent declines versus before, so that's pretty serious. Um, and I think they welcome the news that perhaps there will be something to create uh, some more opportunity again. But I'm guessing they're probably also thinking it's somewhat of a fragile truce. Yeah. And if they can get some sales now, we've seen some increase, increases in Chinese purchases of late, uh, then great. Um, I think on the economies writ large, uh, in other words, the US economy, the Chinese economy on a macro level, uh, you know, maybe there hasn't been that much tangible impact at that level, like say individual sectors perhaps, uh, or individual situations depending on, on uh, your business. Uh, but certainly there's been a big impact on sentiment. And I would say that's bigger probably than the tangible economic hit right now. And, you know, the word I use at the outset, the uncertainty, if you're uncertain, it's going to impact, you know, do you go ahead with that investment right now? Do you go ahead with hiring people right now? And it's not just for an operation that a U.S. company might have in China, but even over here in some cases too. Um, and it clearly has an impact on market sentiment as well. So uh, there has been a negative impact so far. I'm not sure it's all been arrested uh, by what happened last week. Right. And which makes me think about the macroeconomy and the IMF this week is having its um, annual um, conference um, to take a pulse of the world economy. Uh, central bankers and finance ministers from all member countries of the IMF are here to assess the risks. And one of the biggest risks that they see is the global trading system. And the IMF's World Economic um, Outlook report has said that uh, the world economic outlook is actually going to face considerable challenges as, as a direct result of US-China trade tensions. Meg, given that the uncertainties persist, um, how resilient is the global economy to this? Are there ways to offset it? Um, to, and um, what is the outlook for the Chinese and U.S. economies respectively as a result? Well, that's a really good question, Shahoko, and the big uncertainty that's uh, driving a lot of this. The IMF has raised a lot of concerns. It's just released its three flagship reports the last couple of days. Uh, you mentioned the decline, uh, the weaker outlook for global growth, and you see this across pretty much all countries. Uh, a few are doing a little bit better, but uh, the IMF points to this ongoing trade dispute, trade war, affecting sentiment, increasing uncertainty, uh, 
And as a result, as John was just saying, you're not seeing uh, big investment decisions. You're seeing people holding back a little bit because they just don't know where's the market going to be, who's going to be my supplier, who's going to be my buyer. So you are seeing that impact. So the IMF is clearly worried about that. And the next point is, is that countries to deal with this, whether it's you know, supply chains radically changing, the overall sentiment worsening, they don't have a lot of policy space. If you look at all the different regions of the world in terms of what they can do to offset that, you see monetary policy across the board has already done a lot since the global financial crisis, and they haven't really been able to normalize, to use that term, you don't really hear that much anymore, uh, and the new normal may be these persistently low interest rates, which of course create some of their own problems. Think pension funds, insurance companies that want to have very safe investments. So overall, there's a lot of different kind of bubbles that might emerge and might be difficult to deal with. And that, I think, is something that policymakers in many countries are really not focused on. How do you have all those tools in place? Because it really is a constellation of tools you need. Mm -hmm. The other thing they highlighted uh, extensively, both IMF World Bank, is, uh, uh, for instance, climate change. What do you do about that? Countries are not prepared for it. There are going to be huge expenses. And so um, you're seeing, in terms of that one specific area, a lack of preparedness, but also just in terms of having deep enough tools, fiscal policy, monetary policy, that have been stretched in many countries already. Hmm. Um, let's talk about policy coordination. Um, one issue um, that may be raised in phase two, phase three of this bilateral uh, trade agreement is um, uh, foreign exchange, um, currency manipulation. Um, to what extent um, is coordination amongst the, the G7 or the industrialized countries possible in, um, if, if China is to be labeled as a currency manipulator or, as, or such? Um, what, to what extent is there a possibility of countries coming together on that? Uh, well, the U.S. called China currency manipulator this summer in August. I didn't hear anyone else do that. <laughs> no other <laughs> countries followed the U.S. in doing that. The IMF had just put out its annual assessment of the Chinese economy and its global take on exchange rate uh, around the world, and basically China was more or less, not totally where it should be, but not a problem. China's current account has come down dramatically the past few years. They're not intervening in terms of showing up that their foreign exchange reserves going up. They're not overtly pushing down the currency to be more competitive, even though they have many other ways to do that that are not so obvious always. So uh, the uh, U.S. Treasury, the Trump administration, is a little bit uh, alone in this. The IMF is not going to pick this up because the rest of the membership is not there, certainly not the G7, because um, none of them have the same concern, and they're all looking to preserve their trade with China and you won't see the emerging market developing countries take on China also because basically when they look at what China's been doing, they've been trying to change their behavior to become a little bit more maybe, uh, let's say, mainstream in terms of how other countries manage their currencies. They're not there yet, but they pledge to keep getting there, trying to get there. It's a G20 commitment. So uh, I don't see that there'll be a unified effort around currency. And frankly, I don't get the sense from what I hear, whether at the fund or elsewhere, that uh, there's a big push to try and get the IMF to do anything extra right. on currency. Right. The bigger picture, of course, though, is for the United States as well as other countries is to change some of China's economic policies and unfair trade practices. Um, but although there is a consensus within the United States that China has been playing um, unfairly, there is a divide within Washington amongst policymakers, amongst the key players in this, about how exactly to do it. And I'm thinking especially about you know, Lighthizer taking one stance and uh, people like Peter Novaro taking a much more scorched earth approach um, to dealing with China. So Bob, looking at that, um, what, is, is there a division, um, continuing division, 
um, within Washington about how to approach the China challenge and how can we reach a consensus as to what Washington wants from Beijing? Well, yes. That's <laughs> Yes, that's all we write about is the divisions. Um, they change over time. Can I just say one thing? I'll answer that question. Just one thing about the currency. Um, when the U.S. labeled uh, China currency manipulator, it was not a real assessment. They had labeled, they had given China a pass a couple of months before that. It was all part of um, the president being angry at uh, China not uh, buying uh, agriculture purchases, which he thought they promised to do in Osaka, which the Chinese said they didn't. They were just looking for one way to retaliate after another. It wasn't. It was. It was bogus. And we'll see. We'll see. They come. They're due to come out with uh, a report anytime soon. Yeah, this week. I bet be you they'll be back to, or they're probably holding it off to see, so, yeah. you know, as leverage for whether there's a phase one deal. Um, and also, if I might add, I mean, what could they possibly? What does currency manipulation even mean at this point? They, there's so there's tariffs on so many. Items and they're threatening tariffs on so much others. It's it's meaningless. So anyway, um, but the on the divisions, yes, of course, it's hugely divided. The way I think about it is that um, there are people in this administration who think of China as an existential threat, as uh, the biggest threat since fascism, um, and there are people in this administration who think that. Uh, China's a problem. You know, there have been uh, there are practices that they that they uh, do that are uh, wrong, that hurt American companies, um, and that we need to address them. But you know, we're in the in the context of a global economy that we need to keep purring. And Trump's not either of them. He's not a person who thinks that it's an existential threat, and he's not a person who thinks first and foremost of the global economy. And that's why you see it shift back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Because sometimes he sort of leans toward one, and sometimes he sort of leads towards the other. Now, I mean, on the one poll, there's no, I don't think personally there's any deal the U.S. could ever get that would satisfy Peter Navarro because he would just think they would cheat no matter what the Chinese said. I don't, Lighthouse is not as far as that. And then um, there are people in their security who, who have a very, you know, you know, trade's very secondary to them, but you know, again, have this sort of, you know, it's the, the, the second coming of the rise of fascism. And then there are people like, you know, Secretary Mnuchin, who's, who's taken the role that it's a problem, but uh, it's a problem that needs to be put in perspective. And again, as I, th as I say, I don't think the president neatly fits into either of them, and that's why you see the fluctuations. Mm. <clears throat> so, for businesses, doing business in China at the moment. This is a very, very challenging time, to say the least, um, given the uncertainties. Um, on the other hand, China has had a very steady hand, um, oftentimes, in guiding its industrial policy. What, I is there something, instead of the United States simply clamoring for a change in the systemic approach that China has, rather for American companies to, to learn something fr from China. Is there opportunity for us to actually kind of play China's own game and actually win on this? Or is this something that's totally not feasible? You mean for the U.S. to have an yeah. industrial policy? Well, not an industrial <laughs> policy per se, but are there measures that the uh, government can actually have that would encourage um, some kind of tax or protectionist measure that would make them more competitive? Uh, I guess I would put it this way. So the, the, the American business community um, for several years now has had declining optimism about prospects in the future in China, primarily around the lack of a level playing field, which is a pretty broad <coughs> and vague term, um, and being able to compete fairly. It was Less of an issue maybe you know, 20 years ago when China was a much smaller economy and companies were dealing with those issues inside China. Uh, but it became more of a concern as the Chinese economy expanded and as China started to move out and go global. So it wasn't just about perhaps the competitive environment you might face in China, but now it was your competitor in China competing with you in other markets around the globe, including the United States, and perhaps doing so from a protected base at home. And so I think the trend line was of concern for a lot of companies, even as they continued to grow their, their business with China. 
Uh, in a previous life for me, I was president of the U.S. China Business Council for about a dozen years, and we would always poll our membership uh, about how they, say they saw the environment. And, you know, starting five, six years ago, we started to see that, and I'm saying this precisely here, decline in optimism. I'm not saying pessimism because it wasn't that. The numbers are still pretty strong uh, amongst those who had access to China, and that's a, that's a, a big caveat right there. Um, about growth prospects in China and their ability to, to be able to participate uh, in capturing at least some of that growth. Maybe not as much as they would like, uh, but China's clearly a growing market. You know, for the several years now, China's been producing about a third of global GDP growth every year. More than the U.S., more than Japan, more than Europe, and in most years, more than three of them combined. Um, so that's hard to ignore it. But yes, companies wanted to be able to see more fairness uh, in market access, particularly with Chinese companies now moving out and enjoying a more open market in the United States. But companies are pretty strongly uh, unanimous in saying that tariffs are the wrong approach because there's a lot of self-inflicted harm. Um, not necessarily going to be the solution that will actually get China to come up with the kind of, of compromises desired. And I think what we've seen so far with the tariff back and forth is it's kind of led each side to dig in their heels a bit. Uh, I think companies would have been much more strongly in favor of some kind of plurilateral approach. I didn't say multilateral, because I'm not, the WTO is not where the companies were looking for help, but like-minded countries and economies uh, to be able to coordinate an approach to trying to get them to change some of their practices. Hmm. Uh, and I think other countries and economies were primed to do that because it's not just U.S. companies that face these issues in China. It's pretty much all foreign companies, very common concern. So I think that's where there's been a big division. Uh, it's not about what the nature of the problem is. Mm -hmm. Bob had mentioned the, the 301 case that USTR brought, and that's really around protection of intellectual property, uh, an end to force technology transfer, uh, greater market access, and so on. Uh, those are the, the right issues by and large, whether they've characterized them correctly or put them at the you know, right size them, if you will, uh, I think is also uh, subject to disagreement. But the notion that, yes, those are the right issues to be addressed, but probably uh, there would be disagreement that the approach the administration has taken is the right way to get to a solution. Mm -hmm. um, if I could follow up on the tech transfer issue, um, American companies have lost heavily on, on this, but some, some analysts would argue that a lot of the technology that has been um, forced um, to China is now in China's hands, and now China has the ability to take, have an advantage over American technology companies in the future. Is that a, a concern that you might have? The tech transfer issue is very acute for companies that face it, the forced technology transfer issue. And I, and I want to make sure I'm saying that uh, in the right way there, the, the forced technology transfer issue. There is a lot of technology transfer that goes on. Um, you know, if a company is going to enter into an agreement in China, uh, a joint venture in particular, and you've got a Chinese company as your negotiating partner, there's going to be a desire by each partner to try to get what they want out of the deal. And lots of times the U.S. company might be looking at that Chinese partner uh, because they provide some market access that they wouldn't otherwise have or some other capabilities. Increasingly so these days where Chinese companies have gotten much better than uh, a couple of decades ago. Uh, and the Chinese company is probably looking to that U.S. company for a few things too. It might be capital, although in today's China that's, that's probably less of a concern. Uh, but typically it's going to be around technology or, or product capabilities or brand even. Uh, you name it. So there's going to be tech transfer uh, in most of these deals, but most of it voluntary, right? You're going to get uh, some, something out of that deal to compensate you for that technology transfer. And, of course, it can't be technologies that are under export control either by the United States as well. So we have export control rules that are designed to, pr to prevent the transfer of, type of technologies that are deemed to be uh, a national security interest. Um, but the bigger question is when is it forced? And that is when does the Chinese government or a Chinese company, knowing it has the government behind it, say, you know, you're not going to get market access. You're not going to get a license to do anything here unless you transfer this technology that you don't want to. Uh, and that certainly happens in certain sectors. Cloud computing is a great example. In order to enter the cloud computing market in China, um, 
foreign companies are going to have to give up technology. They're also going to have to give up being the face to the customer. Um, and that's just too much for them to have to do. But on the other hand, you've got this significant market. Can you really carve that out of the global market and still remain competitive elsewhere uh, or not? And that's why it's such a critical question for those companies that are in that situation where they have to uh, transfer technology they wouldn't otherwise want to to get market access. One solution to this, to, to come back to your question, uh, is getting rid of those joint venture requirements. Because you know, three quarters of American investment in China today, and it has, it's been this way for I don't know, 15 years at least, is into actually an entity that the U.S. company is going to own 100% of. 25% of U.S. investment has to go into a joint venture, or does go into a joint venture. Some of those by uh, design, but some of those because foreign companies have to joint venture. Those are where the real issues are, and that's where the leverage comes from uh, from the Chinese government. They can also Chinese government can also leverage transfers, perhaps when it's 100% U.S. owned entity, saying you're not going to get uh, <coughs> a license to set up this entity unless you share some technology of some type of entity. But usually it's in those joint venture requirements. And so the business community has been very specific with uh, this administration as well as prior ones that we need to get rid of those joint venture requirements as one means to end technology transfer where it is not voluntary. Separate issue is going to be around cyber issues right. and what that's doing with technology being taken, whether it's from you know, military or defense and so on, uh, or whether it's coming out of the private sector. Right. Um, one question I do want to ask you, Bob, um, before we turn to the audience is um, talking about values. We've talked a lot um, this morning about American values, exporting American values, and at the same time dealing with Chinese control and relinquishing control. Um, I'm thinking specifically about uh, the NBA incident and, and uh, the NBA supporting Hong Kong protesters, but it goes far beyond that. We've seen a lot of um, Chinese um, uh, involvement in repressing um, uh, the freedom to call Taiwan, Taiwan, um, the uh, companies like Marriott and, and Gap not being able to label Taiwan separately from mm -hmm. Um, the, from, from China itself. We're also seeing, for instance, I'm thinking about you know, Tom Cruise coming out with the latest uh, film and he can't wear the jacket that he used to because it has the flag of Taiwan as well as Japan on it, so it's been scrubbed out. These are the kind of incursions that we're seeing from China. What does this mean um, for American values, for American um, enterprises actually doing business. Does, does it enter the calculus, do you think? It should. It I should, mean, you but know, This is a sort of put up or shut up moment, right? I mean, it's easy in the United States to criticize anybody. You know, how much criticism from the NBA or from the NFL is there of the Trump administration? You know, endless, right? How much criticism of any, you know, policy, any history, any legacy of the United States that is embarrassing to all of us. Okay, fine, but what's the penalty? Nothing, right? So if you stand up for those values in China, you pay a penalty. You're not going to go to jail. I mean, it's a question of, you know, I mean, how much does that market mean to you compared to the values you have and the way in which you built this company? Because you built this company because, you know, the freedoms of the United States mattered enormously. And so ethics are really simple when there's no penalty or no price to pay. These ethics get really difficult when you pay a price, and that's, that's what China confronts us with. The other thing that's interesting is that if you look at corporate behavior now compared to corporate behavior in the 80s and 90s when, China, when Japan was the target and the same concerns, there were, um, there were CEOs after CEO uh, condemning Japan, famous CEOs, uh, Iacocca, the head of Intel, um, you know, condemning Japan. And Trump actually <laughs> came into, uh, started to talk about trade issues at that time, but he was only one of many. I mean, what's different about Trump is everybody else has sort of, you know, stopped and he still continues on, you know, saying the sort of same things that he uh, said. But the difference was, U.S. companies weren't in Japan. They wanted to get in Japan. Mm -hmm. And so it was easier to criticize because they were locked out. American companies are in China, and it's much more difficult. So it is, yeah, it's a, China, I mean, the, uh, the thing that I find totally fascinating about China 
is it upends everything you think you thought. It makes you rethink, you know, what is it, <laughs> what's significant about the United States? What's significant about the world? And it just, you know, it's just an enormous challenge for everybody. Mm. Let me add a, a comment, because you, you, you had mentioned uh, Taiwan, for example, and how companies treat it. And I, and I think I would differentiate that a bit from what happened with the NBA. Um, you know, the, the State Department, the U.S. government, United Nations, the Olympics, they all recognize there's one China. Um, no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. And they also carefully label things. Uh, it's complicated. It's nuanced. And I think for a lot of people, it's way, way more complicated than they can appreciate. And so I think companies have gotten into trouble when they don't quite understand it or whoever their web person is is, is redoing a page and ends up making Taiwan a different color. Um, but that's something you wouldn't see the U.S. government do either. And I don't think you should ask companies necessarily to get ahead of that. But it is complicated, and that's why these issues keep coming up. And one of the things that uh, I always advise companies is make sure you're looking at your website. Make sure you're looking at, making, at how you're labeling things and not implying somehow that Taiwan is an independent country, because it isn't. And even, like I say, the United States, the Olympics, the U.N. would say that too. Mm -hmm. um, but these are going to continue to get tripped up on, I'm sure, because it is so, so complicated. But we shouldn't be asking companies to do more than, than those organizations I mentioned are doing themselves. Right. So it follows the State Department. Code. Yeah, because it, it, you know, if you're advocating separatism, then yes, the, the, that's something that's going to be crossing the line in China. Um, and that's where I think that issue was, was, was really uh, focused on. And I think that's a little bit different. Uh, to a certain extent than what happened with the NBA. The Chinese government was trying to make it about supposedly advocating separatism for Hong Kong. That's not what was going on. That's not what uh, was tweeted by, by Daryl Morey. Uh, and I think in the end that uh, the NBA commissioner got it right. It took maybe a news cycle, but uh, he said, you know, this is not something we endorse, but we certainly support his right for free speech. Okay. Great. Well, thank you. That gives us a lot of food for thought. Um, if you have any questions, there are microphones that are roaming. If you could please raise your hand. Um, yes, I see a brave soul, Kent. <laughs> Mike, Mike. Are we talking about an industrial policy? And it strikes me that in rethinking our approach to China, we're contrasted in a world where they have a long-term strategy, they have a set of economic priorities, and we don't. And the question is, can we really compete with that different model? We've faced it a bit in Japan. We adapted to it. Uh, we did well in, in the longer term. But can we really avoid picking uh, a set of key priorities? Let's say semiconductors. Would we like a world in which we were totally dependent on China for microelectronics? Could I take a crack at that? Yeah. <clears throat> I used to cover Kent uh, years ago when he was at the Council of Competitiveness, so I know mm -hmm. he's raised these issues for many years. I think one of the biggest um, uh, absences in this current administration's efforts towards China is exactly what Kent's talking about. If you think about it, it's all defensive. It's tariffs on this, sanctions on that. You can't come here you know, unless you do X, Y, and Z. But where is the affirmative agenda? Um, you know, where is the, I mean, the U.S. leads in almost, if not all, the technologies that China talks about in terms of technologies of the future. <coughs> the U.S. has a lead. So what's the U.S. plan to keep that lead? We don't do, the United States doesn't do industrial policy in the way that China does. But it's phony, it's, it's mistaken to think the U.S. doesn't do industrial policy. I mean, during the Reagan era, um, uh, when again, the, uh, when the challenge was Japan, they, uh, they built Semitech, which was a project to keep the semiconductor industry you know, ahead of uh, Japan, or to, to save part of the semiconductor industry. They created the Semiconductor Research Council, or Research Corporation rather, which pooled um, semiconductor research. There are ways in which the United States uh, stays ahead. It has a rich innovation system which relies enormously on federal funding of basic research. The administration uh, plans to cut it every single year. Congress has reinstated it. But it, it's, a, it's remarkable to me. And I've asked, I've asked administration officials exactly what I've said. So why, 
you know, why don't you, what's, you know, <laughs> what's holding you back? And then all of a sudden they become traditional Republicans. Well, we don't pick winners and losers. Right. As if tariffs <laughs> isn't exactly <laughs> picking a winner and loser. Right. So, anyway. <laughs> That's my speech on that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I don't think we should feel like the China model is one we want to emulate. I'm not sure we want to go down to their level um, necessarily, and I don't think necessarily that uh, they're going to have this great uh, success either. Um, they can create a lot of damage in the meantime, though, mm -hmm. through you know supporting certain industries and, and overcapacity and everything else. But even you know the headline, a lot of the headlines today are around China's slowdown. And is the Chinese economy in trouble? I don't think it's as in much trouble as, as uh, a lot of folks seem to. I don't think it's in as much trouble as the Trump administration thinks to. And I think they got a lot less leverage around that than, than they think. And somebody else may have an opinion on that. <laughs> um, but they are slowing down. Part of it is the fact their economy is so doggone big. If you just look at that real GDP growth number every year, it's going to get smaller. It's off of a bigger base. There's some math going on here. But that's not all of it. There's another portion of it that is some choices they've been making in you know, the last five or six years, and that is they've gone back to funneling more resources and more credit to their state-owned sector, which is incredibly inefficient. Uh, and that's explained some of the problems they've had when they were doing better and had higher growth and more efficient growth uh, is primarily being driven by their private sector. The private sector is being a little more star for capital now. You've got people like Bert Keidel who can speak better to this question than, than, than I can. Uh, but I don't think their model is nef necessarily one that uh, we want to emulate. Mm. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I just wanted to pick up on what uh, John was saying and Bob too, what it's done, this point about China still channeling a lot of resources into the state-owned enterprises, keeping that going, and then limiting the other sectors of the economy. It drives a lot of the, what we would consider to be more private, privately run or private type entities into uh, what we would call shadow banking, different sources of finance. So they're borrowing at higher rates. They're maybe not, uh, the lenders are not necessarily doing the same sorts of credit checks, assessments. And so you may have a growing sort of undercurrent of debt there that's not captured in the official statistics. And I think a lot of these entities figure in the end, oh, well, the government will bail us out. They'll just tell the People's Bank to tell the banks to lend to these guys and keep it going, which I do think can keep things going for a long time, but it builds up and it builds up. And the question is, will it reach a point where that then becomes a limit on the Chinese government's ability to handle all this? Right. Not yet. Right. Okay. Um, the gentleman here, if you could hold off. Thank you all for a great um, discussion. My name is Michael Waller. I'm a member of the Wilson Center National Cabinet. The um, predicate for my question is the assumption that one can advance one's own arguments more effectively if you're able to articulate the arguments of the party on the other side of the table. Can you take us behind the closed doors of these trade negotiations and give us some sense about what the Chinese are bringing to the table in terms of the main points that they want to articulate or the context they put around them in order to persuade their American counterparts to see things their way. Thank you. Um, <laughs> well, um, I think, <laughs> um, how would I phrase this? I think, I mean, it's the Americans are the demanders in the terms of, you know, the trade world. I mean, so they're asking for a lot of different things, right? And I think the Chinese response is, let's try to slow it down. Let's try to stretch it out. Um, uh, it's one-sided. You know, what about chain? You know, what about um, restrictions? Uh, what about um, things that we want? You know, visas, access to new technology. You know, acquisitions that you've you know you've stopped, um, and um, they've tried to make it more what they would call balanced. I mean, that's how they would argue it. And also, fundamentally, remember, these are two sovereign nations, right? The United States can't get China to do anything. China has to agree to it. Um, I mean, we, we sort of overstate <coughs> the power of the United States enormously. I mean, when the United States uh, negotiated a trade deal with Colombia, you know, a moderate-sized country that's enormously dependent on the U.S., it took years, years, right? I mean, so, there's a limit to what the U.S. can do, and 
that China has the veto of just not agreeing. I mean, the, the cost to China if they don't agree is tariffs on virtually everything they sell to the United States and maybe the loss of the U.S. market. But still, it's a sovereign nation and there's a limit to what the U.S. can push. And the, and the U.S. negotiators realize that. Can I just add, I found with, in my negotiations with the Chinese when I was at Treasury doing financial services in the WTO, or even working with counterparts at the People's Bank at the IMF, I always tried to use arguments that would be persuasive, that would end up, we'd end up with a win-win, trying to come up with arguments that would show to the other person's advantage, the other country's advantage, that it's to their benefit to enter this agreement. And somehow I get the sense that may be lost, as, as Bob was really just illustrating. And I think that's really unfortunate because you get much more change likely to happen if they see it in their own interest. Right now, I don't think the U.S. is negotiating in a way which is going to make the Chinese more inclined to change their state-owned enterprise-based system. So uh, I, I don't think we found a way to do it effectively, and we haven't brought in other allies, as you know, my colleagues were suggesting, that have the same problems, you know, right. plurilateral approach. I get, here's what I would add to it. Um, you know, also not new, uh, but certainly intensified in the last couple of years, is the amount of distrust in the relationship. Um, and it's been building. Uh, it's always been always been there to a certain extent, but certainly been building, but over the last two years it's been intensified. And from the Trump administration perspective, there are those who, who uh, have the view that you can't trust China to honor an agreement, so they're going to be very careful how they negotiate one. Two, as Bob said, those who see China as the enemy, not in the future, but today, and you don't do a trade deal with the enemy. Um, but at the same thing, coming back the other way from Beijing, a lot of distrust towards the United States. Some. Uh, with the president because they're very wary about how they can do a deal with him with any confidence that they can close it without it changing on them. So they're already wary in how they, they uh, will, will approach doing a deal with the United States. Uh, but there are those in China too who see the U.S. as their principal enemy um, and who also feel that the United States is really bent on containing China's rise. Uh, again, not new. That element's been there in, in, uh, in China all along. Um, but They've been emboldened by approaches or by actions taken on, on either side, uh, and those that are more hawkish on either side, I think, are, are in the stronger position now. This matters because in China, they've had, throughout their several decades of, uh, you know, in the post Mao, Mao era, uh, factions, yes. And I'm going to go out a little bit on a limb here because I can see Win Lord and I can see State Roy back there who know a lot more about this than I do, but generally, you've got those who are more reform-minded and those who are more conservative-minded, those who might favor a more reform-type uh, uh, economy, those who favor maybe more of the state planning Soviet style, those who tend to be more, just by uh, what I just said, uh, uh, favorable towards the U.S., those who see the U.S. more uh, suspiciously. And I would say those in, in the second camp have probably got a stronger voice right now because they see a lot of the actions the United States is taking. We haven't even talked about say Huawei, for example, uh, but they see all that part of a, of a design by the United States to try to keep China down. So you can imagine in that environment, it kind of makes it hard in their own interagency discussion about how they do, do a deal with the United States. How much do they concede? Because you're going to have voices over there uh, that have a lot to point to right now who will say you can't trust the United States and we don't necessarily want to do a deal with them like uh, they're demanding. A mini deal? Yeah, that can be done perhaps if it's purchases. Um, but I think we haven't seen China uh, yet indicate how, how they're going to ink that deal, and Bob alluded to this. Uh, they're going to step up agricultural purchases. They've already started doing that. Are they going to get to the number that the president put out there? I don't know. Um, are they going to require anything else around Huawei? Probably. So I think you know, the two things that they wanted uh, as they went into these talks, you know, the, as uh, it's actually been there since the beginning, is relief on tariffs. And so far, all we've seen is no additional tariffs, right? Mm -hmm. uh, not relief of what's been out there. And you still got uh, tariffs that might go into effect on December 15th. There would be new tariffs as well. Uh, those are still on the table unless this deal gets done. But the other thing I think that they want to see something on is Huawei. And that's a much more difficult issue for both sides for the reasons I just said. Um, could I just add something? You made me think of something there. So we're at a different point in the negotiations at the moment, right? I mean.
what's hanging out there are uh, the remaining tariffs on basically consumer goods. Um, uh, <laughs> when the president threatened tariffs on consumer goods, everybody but Navarro tried to talk him out of it. I mean, he went ahead and threatened with it anyway. Um, we're, we're, I mean, tariffs are always sort of shooting yourself in the foot a little bit, or maybe a lot, because um, uh, the U.S. companies are the ones paying the, uh, paying the price. But in this one, in what's remaining, these are like 25% tariffs on iPhones, 25% tariffs on laptops. Consumers are going to notice iPhones going up 20% or 15%. The Chinese realize that the threat of tariffs is d more and more diminished the further we get along. I think the U.S. is sort of looking for an excuse not to have to put those last tariffs into effect, or if they put them into effect, to have some sort of process where they really don't go, they really don't go into effect so you don't go to a Best Buy or go to an AT&T store and have to pay 20 percent more for an iPhone. Um, so I think the, the leverage of the U.S. diminishes on the tariff part. And on Huawei, I mean, it reminded me, we're very close to a decision on Huawei about um, what sort of licenses, if any, will be uh, permitted. And I mean, the expectation largely is that uh, non-national security related um, items will be allowed to be shipped to, um, uh, provided to Huawei. Now, of course, what does national security mean? I mean, that's a very difficult decision. So I. And it goes right into that debate you're talking about within the administration. Yep. Those who would say everything and those yep. who would say mm, exactly. you know, maybe cell phones yep. are okay, but yep. not uh, 5G you know, base stations. No, definitely. And also, it's so technical that if you're not, I mean, for the sort of average person, I mean, to understand this widget versus that widget, good luck. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, the, the lady here in the white shirt. Thank you. Uh, this is Li Hong Wang from IBM. So I'd like to hear the opinion from the panelists um, with the uh, U.S. Admin administration ratcheting up the measures to uh, impose the stricter control on the technology export to China. So going forward, are we going to see a dualistic uh, system of technology in, in which uh, there will be two separate sets of uh, infrastructure and the standards in technology um, between China and the U U.S., or this decoupling will be limited within a boundary because the globalization of supply chain is so deep that it's just not uh, realistic to really decouple. Thank you. I think that, you know, it's not inevitable that the U.S. and China are going to spiral down and end up in a Cold War. That's certainly a plausible scenario. I think there's other scenarios that suggest that that doesn't have necessarily have to be the outcome. Um, people matter. We've got an election coming up in the year, and uh, you know, uh, it, I think it's hard to predict where things might go. But I would say, no matter how things end up, and if you get maybe a more pragmatic uh, administration that comes in that might return to a more multilateral approach, for example, as some of the candidates have talked about, or maybe less reliance on tariffs. Um, you will still see, I think, some decoupling, because I think the momentum is already there and underway. But the extent of it is what's to be determined. So yes, U.S. export controls are, towards China are going to be tightened up. Uh, on the investment side, uh, there will also be greater scrutiny over inbound Chinese investments. But the operative question is, to what extent is national security going to be defined? Is it going to be broadly, or is it going to be more narrowly defined on legitimate security risk. The business community would, would clearly want to see it defined you know, on, on legitimate security risks as narrowly as possible, but recognizes that there needs to be a change from the current rules today because technologies change and, and maybe there needs to be a rethink, but not have it be so broad-based that you know, uh, selling a pencil to Huawei is, is, is defined as being a security risk. So I think there will be some, but the extent of it is still to be determined. There's also a momentum, momentum for decoupling, though, on the Chinese side, too. Um, they have certainly uh, seen it made clear to themselves their vulnerability to relying on the United States for certain technologies. You know, when you, when you put Huawei and on the entities list and then you see how much they rely on U.S. supply, even though there's maybe some workarounds, yeah, that tells them that they've got vulnerabilities they need to address. This is kind of the, the sad irony of, of the approach here. 
The business community has been concerned about China's indigenous innovation drive for a decade uh, and how it's designed to, to uh, in essence, be a protectionist policy that might keep American companies uh, out of the market there. Uh, China's Made, in China, Made in, in China 2025 program is, in essence, indigenous innovation with a, with a different name. Uh, and it's the centerpiece of, of the trade representative, Robert Lighthizer's 301 case as well, is, is really focused on things like Made in China 2025. But at the same time, the other actions being taken by other parts of the administration are leading the Chinese to conclude they need to double down on indigenous innovation because of those vulnerabilities. So I think there's momentum for some decoupling on both sides that's going to continue on, but I think there could be limits on it that might not make it as extreme as some might want on each side. I would just add, I'm a, I am a little worried, I, I hope that's, you're right, that it won't be that bad, but I am a little worried because the U.S., certainly this administration, has been willing to, or has been energetic about stretching that national security definition to cover all sorts of things. I mean, when we hit Canada, Canadian steel, uh, based on a national security <laughs> Uh, law, I, I was just astounded. I mean, how can Canada be a national security threat to the United States? So it really, I mean, I think that's such a clear signal of how far this administration is willing to go and grab, like in the CFIUS process, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the U.S., which is uh, strengthening its rules right as we speak. Uh, Will that then be an opportunity, or will we start seeing this kind of thing where it gets to be, instead of a technical discussion among those who really understand it in the different agencies, a much more political discussion because they've broadened yep. the uh, aspects of foreign investment that they're looking at under the law, the amended law. So uh, I am a little worried. I'm not maybe. It's fine to be worried. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll stop there. Yeah. Right. Um, and also just to add to that national security issue, um, other countries are actually taking um, a, a leaf out of America's playbook and, mm -hmm. and using that for um, uh, justifying their own um, trade barriers as well. So um, I know there are some other questions, but I'm afraid that we are running out of time. So hopefully our panelists will be able to take your questions um, offline so to speak. Um, but in the meantime, if you could please um, help me in thanking our panelists today. Thank you.